Hey, everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, we are about to embark upon the 622nd episode of the new social environment in our sub series, the Wednesday afternoon poetry reading series. Our host today for the 98th of these readings is poet and filmmaker Steph Gray who has invited Julian Talamantes Berlaski, Brenda Coltis, Jen Eliana Hoffer, and Brenda Jima to, um, to read as well. And the reading will take place, well, it's gonna take place in and out of time. Um, if you're joining us at this series for the first time, then you might uh, just keep an eye on the chat I'll introduce each poet uh, with some basic info, and then there'll be other there'll be links to uh, the various endeavors of all of these brilliant artists um, listed in the chat, as well as information on the rail and some advice for uh, managing screen sharing, which I don't quite know how to articulate, but said that I would, so I'm trying to, but I'm failing. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I'll introduce Steph, uh, who is author of seven poetry collections, including Shorthand and Electric Language Stars from Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs and the chapbooks, Words Are What You Get, Slash You Do It For Real, and A Country Road Going Back In Your Direction. Gray's experimental Super 8 films and videos have screened internationally, including at the San Francisco Cinematheque, Anthology Film Archives, Microscope Gallery, and Mono Nowhere in NYC. I think Steph will say a few words about um, putting together the, this lineup today and then come back to read a little later in the, in the hour. Please welcome uh, Steph Gray to the rail. Hey, everyone. Um, can everyone hear me OK? OK. Uh, the mini introduction is also um, in the chat if you want to access the PDF. Um, great to see everyone today. Uh, I'd like to thank Anselm for inviting me to guest curate and the Brooklyn Rail staff, especially Carolyn, uh, for your support of today's reading. Uh, briefly, I just wanted to share a few words about how all of the readers today have especially inspired me and my own work and whose writings I look to for enlightenment. Everyone here today has experimented in language in such a way that has made me see the world differently, made me see words differently, made me pause on the page and look away and think about what I read and wonder in a good way, wow, where have I just been transported to? Everyone here has books on a shelf where I've written down questions and quotes for inspiration and the sticky notes on my computer and in my Missy Moleskine notebooks. Julian has made me think about the origins of language in unexpected ways in querying the language. Jan Eliana has made me think about truth through subtle wordplay and secrets hidden under politics. Brenda Cortez has made me think about the countless untold stories underneath the city and her relationship to it. And Brenda Ajima has made me think about environmental and eco-poetics and other modes of being beyond the human through poetry and prose. I'm excited we have a mix of West and East Coasters here today and grateful for the community still in these times, not to be cliched, but still at times of distance. Thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you, Steph. Um, thanks, and thanks for putting this putting this together. And um, and before we start, I just well, I want to also thank Carolyn for uh, hosting the last couple of weeks while I was uh, underground, and proving that I'm probably unnecessary to this whole affair. Uh, so thanks, Carolyn. <laughs> um, our first reader will be Julian Talamantes Berlaski poet and country singer, author of, of Mongrelitude, Advice for Lovers, and Gowanus Atropolis. With Juan in the Pines, they released an EP, Glittering Forest, in 2019. Their first full-length album is coming out this summer, and Julian's poetry was recently included 
in two particular anthologies, When the Light of the World Was Subdued, Our Songs Came Through, a Norton anthology of Native Nations poetry, and We Want It All, an anthology of radical trans poetics, uh, both of which were published in 2020. Please welcome Julian to the rail. Thanks, Anselm, and Steph, and Carolyn. Um, can you hear me? OK. Flock of stars. Should I be a shepherd, eyeing my flock of stars? Riding backward on the train through unromantic Newark to a garden in New York where I'd meet my friends, poets, the ones who knew what nectar tasted like. And once they'd taken the nectar into their bodies, well, others began to seek them out, longing for that sweetness on their tongue. They leaned against a wall of flowers and wore caps emblazoned with a single blue rose. Bees swirled lazily but purposefully about. I'm accurate to my surrounds, they sang. I can swim in a drop of dew. I can make a flower spurt from my finger. Rock in a snowball jelly in a donut. I heard a revelator say there's gold in the head of the bear and my aspect is all simplistic. It's hard to tell the singer from the song. The sun on the water seemed to be moving in a spiral with just a peak of the creek shuttling through. You got this life to live. What do you want to do? Take dictation from God, the poet said. Pretty much lays about and eat chips. It must be my disposition out of green stuff woven. The sun on the water seemed to be moving in a spiral with just a peak of the creek shuttling through. You got this life to live. What do you want to do? Take dictation from God, the poet said. Pretty much lays about and eat chips. It must be my disposition out of green stuff woven. For one who knows how to ripen a fruit. This is for the poet David Larson. When the audacity of the seen world eclipses the glory of the love of God, then do my sleeves grow long. A glowing pear amidst my rubric, green and crimson, clover and vermilion. But how does the pear taste, the angel wants to know? Unctuous, buttery even soft on the tongue like sugared sand. How that we cognize our surrounds, joy and pestilence, rats and clouds. What is it that makes a meadow? I mean, what halts the trees in place? When the mentalist starts to believe in their own tricks, their own lies, they call it shut eye. What is this atmosphere about my head and what gilded forms unfold themselves to empty out their secrets for the daisy in my cap? This is called Wave of Murmuration. That sparrows and starlings are here at all is owed to one hapless Shakespeare enthusiast or so the myth goes. And the sparrows went forth and did their thing, and the starlings installed themselves in the eaves of the Natural History Museum. That part is true. I'll show you how to tell a purple martin from a starling, a cowbird from a grackle, 
at the 1100th hour, when as like a hawk, you are dazzled by their murmurations, then you can tell me my fortune. The rain in Spain, the COVID I may have gotten in Spain, when I limped with my Spanish cane along the cobblestones of Marbella, with its bitter, gorgeous oranges and its numerous mafias, on the arm of my butch friend, the boat captain, the one who holds it steady for me with a base clef tattooed on her arm, like guiding the groove of my step, a real Johnny Cash in the Tennessee two feel. And I feel like we're two elephants with trunks entwined, eating sardines and berenjenas, tea for tea. It's not shocking what love can do. Weather fooling the forsythias into bloom from Andalusia to California. Sometimes a thing that makes a good story is its holes. Like a heron who avoids casting a shadow on its prey. The trick is to take off your glasses and stand with your face to the sun. Blessed are the cracks, Groucho Marx said for they shall let in the light. The tools of poetry. Walking by the river, thinking of that tool, I couldn't cry. The cherry blossoms were opening and on the verge of opening. The trash in the waterfall still couldn't cry, and the tampon that had bloomed in the wet water still couldn't, still couldn't. Never leave the premises, said Rumi, on being in the poem, on being in the room of the poem. I know the pun was cheap. They found a new star today in a region of warped space, and they gave it an English name, Arendelle. Down by the river, though I'd given it a wide berth, a goose hissed at me, saw its pink tongue, swallows dipping along the schuylkill and a red-winged blackbird streamed through the cherry trees. There was trash and shit everywhere and the glory and the beauty and the smashed youngling bottles and the exhaust I breathed. And could I have the discernment to realize which were my tools and which my hindrances? poetry in the glass, poetry in the water, which was an imperfect mirror, the way that milk is in the butter. Sky hammer. I took my sky hammer and pounded out a few choice clouds, cirrus and I don't know, nimbus as in a god on earth, moving in space as a great auroral mist. A god who beholds the sparrows washing in the dusty gravel of Frankfurt Avenue, giving me cause to rant or giving me means to roll. Ride with me in the shadowy afterworld, beyond the spider of a doubt, along a sidewalk littered with leaves. Don't be plain, said the cloud. Find the ornament that please you best. Or elsewise, sugared in stars, go on and rail in a useless manner against the inevitable dawn time. People of the dawn come up drumming and beat on a pillow even if a drum is not available. Happy fortune. Fortune has come round for you again. In this pocket world of a minor horned god, I balance my lunch in the arms of my ancestors. Tom Cord grapes and weeping cherries, they were my arms, lackadaisic in the sky, 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 holding their sky hammer as if it were the baby Buddha. And I thought, if there was a world beyond, I could become one of those assholes who gets their sugar from fruit and regard the one who points out my faults as a revealer of treasures and regard the one who points out my faults as a revealer of treasures. Thanks everyone for listening. Uh, I'm just gonna read one more. I'm really 
excited for this lineup. Thanks again, Steph, for putting this together. This is called The English Queen and the Indian Boy. From what I can understand, a star crossed with a mycelial structure, crossed with a bee, speaks to me in the form of a cloud dripping rain. And in its patter, I discern the words and the pattern of the drops. But I have already seen this hand I hold before me. I mean, this hand making the cerulean vermilion. I mean, making the blue one red. And oh, I was red to the core. In the world of the mushrooms, one could see me without varnish. Titania with one syllable removed. The English queen or the Indian boy, which was it was not the question. I was clocked. No hormones could save me. No knife could unearth me. I sang with the worms, no new song. No new song under the sun. The greatest messiness humbled in the hard rain, soaked through to the shoe, wetted to the toes. Christ, the hard rain down can rain. It was all too obvious to be believed. It was all how it had already been written, blue clouds, blue tears rolling down my face. It was all how it had already been drawn or painted in the schools of art. I rolled the dustings of the eraser, into a smutty pink ball and ate it. What could those gone letters tell me? And dropped the wore out battery into my tea. What power, what do ye? Clock of ages toll for the spider, toll for thee, looking at its hand in a wilderment of arrows shot at random toward the April sun. What's the matter, son? Afraid of the luminous darkness? Behold my breast and my scars, bare chested, impervious to your light. And what to your exit then, tugging at the curtain's rope and with all that ink on your fingers, stultified, finally apprehended, obvious as a cowbell? Thanks, everybody. Hi. That was amazing. And uh, I'm so happy to be here. And thank you to Steph and, and Anselm and the Brooklyn Rail. And so happy to be reading with so many wonderful friends here today. Can you hear me fine? Season the beans, season the room, the desk lamp, the line of pins, the tangle of paper clips, and the lion's breath seasons the broth. I put my face on and began to write. The lion's fallen hairs became felt and make a useful hat. The lion's paws warm my shoulders like a weighted blanket, and the lion's snore a lullaby. The purr of the lion's pleasure pleases me. The lion has its own room and its own meat. It wears a red coat in cold rain and greets me at the door. Nudges, rubbing nose against my human legs. A truce between us. We had come to accept each other, both locked inside a pleasant enough house. But we want out and we push at the cracks, push at the trap, like the little mouse who made itself even littler who banged and banged against metal and squeezed out in reverse. Fled the trap of the unknown with only its nose for a guide, the nose that led it into the trap, trap of kindness. Nightshades. I asked for a book of wax. It was golden and thick, but it couldn't be opened and couldn't be held even with cotton gloves on. And it couldn't be read near open fire or on hot days, 
Like Times Square, it was astonishing to behold. I loved my golden book, and so did my friends who came to admire its radiant glow inside an archival box. My golden book could not be shared with children at bedtime or with the bereaved needing comfort or the confused needing wisdom. And yet, even as its brilliance blinded one, one's eyes, it remained beloved. Two. I went to a city of fishes and a city of witches, and there I beheld the red wool of a red coat, and I beheld the grand homes of sea captains and a poet's library, and I beheld a judge's gavel, and I beheld pewter tankards and drops of beer served in dragon-stimmed goblets, and I beheld a shop that sold witches' balls, a kind of glass sphere that caught the sun's eye and the dream and dream catchers made of string and feathers for rear view mirrors, rune stones and crystals sold in small dark sacks. And I beheld a suite of tarot cards spread in a shop window and bundles of dried and fragrant herbs hanging from ceilings. I beheld spells for love and fortune cast from used paperbacks of the occult. Notes for a tea. Take them a cake or fruit on a stick. I eat out of the jar and scrape the skin of an orange and take my time to read handwritten notes posted on the wall. Be kind, they said, sticking in their signs in the lawn. Be nice or leave, said the bartender. And I spit on all the paper napkins, but I'm always kind to the cashier. In the woods, I built an altar, not like in church, more like in nature or in head shop. I carefully placed rolling papers and a glass pipe in harmony. There are teas for sleeping and some teas will bring you wealth. Would you drink a tea for true love? Do you like or make potions? I collect bits of paper, cast rune stones, read cards and lay out my best silk. To my love and my beloveds, be kind and be akin, be righteous, be soft and be firm, be pleased with yourself inside of our kindness, which we wore as tunics, not which we wore as garments, as in tunics, not jumpers or dresses. Our cups overflow with coins, our love invented an animal. Catch a wolf. I take a book in hand and want to sleep. I belong to the daylight and to the smallest of woodpeckers, which during mating season make the largest racket, drilling into dead oaks. I belong to a family of tiny noisemakers. It took more than a year to quiet my mind, to be a beast of daylight rather than a nocturnal drunken animal. I became a daylight beast of spiral notebooks, of bitten down pencils, of stray fur shed in the wake. Cave. My soul lowered by a thread into a cold lake inside a flooded mine shaft five stories down. It felt like a color, not a sensation of temperature. If it were a color, it was chartreuse. I called for a UFO to show itself and it presented as a plasma screen in the sky. A sensation like inhabiting a sealed can of wet and plastered grape leaves. It felt like moonlight inside a paint can. Please keep a lid on it lest it evaporate, lest it dissolve like cave paintings destroyed by human breath. That day I felt a handprint on the inside. It felt like bruised ribs. Bald eagles, hot paper in the wind, like a flag was raised from the dirt and the flag of dirt had powerful feathers. At first it was like ice skating into a watery hole beneath the dirty flag roosting on serpent's arms. 
That feeling lasted all day. My forehead felt useless and hard like a turquoise ring locked inside a vault. Log cabins. My tongue tastes like lime built up in a cooking pot and I use a mirror inside an abandoned log cabin to comb my hair, which is as dead and long as antlers. My tears fell like broken glass, fell like broken glass on the ground that no one bothered to clean up. And somehow I arrived in something smaller than a car and the wooden wheels were like secretly eating in a museum or library. Drawing. I began to draw long lines like hoarfrost on a pencil tip and my fist felt like a hand grenade, like writing on sandpaper and like melting my fingerprints on ice. My neighbor's boots are a rough tongue on carpeting while our doors bounce slightly. It felt like the time a man offered to tell me a Viking saga. Was he speaking in code? It felt like sleeping under a silver mylar blanket on a bed of pine needles in the open. Sex. Afterwards, my thighs and ass felt strong and wild like the dappled horse buttocks inside a Lenora Carrington painting. Riding in a new car. Riding in a new car is like climbing the devil's tower. The car tastes like luxury coffee and exiting through the passenger side is like shopping with credit cards of platinum. We ride and talk trying to catch a glimpse of the devil's nest. It is like returning to a beehive, but of human voices and it stings to be near language. Thank you. Anselm, can you unmute? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> yeah, what is, it wasn't letting me uh, unmute. Uh, thanks, Brenda. That was really great. I'm sorry I didn't introduce you. I experienced digital dissolution um, right, as you, right before you started. But everybody, Brenda Cultus, you should read all of her amazing books, especially the brand new one, The Writing of an Hour, which just came out. Thanks, Brenda. And now next, uh, we will hear from the fabulous Steph Gray, who has brought us here together today. Okay, everyone, um, I guess you can hear me okay. Um, I have a couple of prose poems. Uh, we're gonna show them on the screen. I know the lane breaks are now uh, sexy, but I think it may help to have it on the screen if you want to see the words. Uh, all right. Um, this first one is called Where Do You Even Begin to End? And it starts with a quote from the Human League, that band, from that song, Keep Being Fascination, uh, where the truth may need some rearranging, no meaning left to hold. It's like, where do you even? Where do you even begin to end? I had this kind of like, whoa, convergence of the universe trying to tell me something moment. Where by the bowels gone? About Robert Moses, he loves the public, but not as a people. And so it Melanie's beautiful people here on Auto Loop. Yes, Mr. Moses, we live next door. They got high in finding meaning. They didn't let me into the beach. Others couldn't find it. Ed Holter. Quote, love has social climbers soon realize I'm a dead end. Quote, it didn't disappear like tears in the rain. It's there, but you can't see it. The city doesn't do nothing. Everyone is skilled. Back then, there wasn't any test prep, a language that doesn't need to be translated. We have been through three hurricanes. Analysis is denial with more words. The bus to Staten Island was being eliminated. They went to see the city that they want to see and refuse to see the parts they don't like. I have no idea how to traverse the landscape. Becoming ineligible for assistance because you make too much. Rip it good. They were like, what is this? 
Can I just be a person? Ben Everett, I'd like to be the admissions director of New York. Her fame came from nowhere. Working three jobs and still living paycheck to paycheck. No read, what's good? Not much at all. Lincoln Center was conceived in the 1950s as a slam clearance project. I'd like to know how the concrete center can live with itself. Maybe they'll even sing along with it. People can think something about you that isn't true. She doesn't know anyone who speaks in long sentences anymore. Silence as a presence is the best revenge. Apple has no plans to build factories in the US. Tom Robbins rearranged the nightmare. Working 12 to 14 hours a day and not being able to pay bills. Privilege is derived from the suffering of others. Of course they may. It's a struggle. Just say that. Um, this next poem is for Ricky Power and uh, it comes with a quote at the beginning, which was from his obituary. I guess he was like the fourth beastie boy. He did a lot of photography of New York City and he passed away within the past year or so. And in the obituary, somebody he was working with said about him trying to work with his archives and try to make more money, maybe being on social media and stuff like that. And this person said, but you have to show up for that. But you have to show up for that, slash, cruelly reducing the world to words. A low roar fades in and out. They saw they were there on social media. They saw who you know and who's pulling for you. No conceptual framework to pack it all into. I think that ended up being what happened. Like walking into a horror movie, but everything is real. For demand, deconstruction was terrifyingly a theoretical justification for erasure of his past, cruelly reducing the world to words, snatching at eternity, that big range of empty frequency, calling into question the absolute truth of anything, like a dream, but you know it's not a dream. There is no ultimate meaning. We were asked what was going on. There's warm distortion. Everyone looks like everyone else. Simulation of static. The question is, where are we all going to go now? High and low frequencies rolled off like crazy. I decided, let me get out of here. A comforting, droning, industrial quality. We're going to backtrack that. Sparkly and rough in the top end. This is the last thing I'd expect to wake up to. Wishy-washy in the low end. Nobody puts baby in a corner quote became a rallying cry for disaffected Generation X. And Sam records, the team as the base catapulted the pickup room out of the groove. Oh yeah, that happened. Behind all of the noise, a whole world folded inside, driving through the analog outward. The middle ground between sincerity and sarcasm, handling the heart signal input. It is what it is, giving it that vintage warmth. I don't know how this could happen around here. Taking out a loan to go to school so you can get a job to pay off the loan. We're not out of this. Having fewer glitches. We're not going to apologize. Someone keeping you as a secondary character in the documentary of their life that you haven't seen, but they have. This is what it is going to be. There is no other word for it. Um, this is called Hate Returns, and uh, I won't get into the technicalities, but for those of you who do a lot of editing, a lot of copy editing and proofreading, hard returns has a certain definition. Whether you know that or not, I think we can read the poem, but that's where the term comes from. Hard returns. 
Change the heavy tones of what you know. Imagine what was beyond the softer tones of what you didn't know. Change the heavy tones of what you thought you knew. Who returned the meaning to you without a point of no return? What looked beyond what you thought the words stopped their meaning? What words still had meaning but were not really there? What words were really there but meant nothing? What words meant something but they told you later they didn't mean anything? Why, if the words stop at the end of the line, is it a hard return? Why not a hard stop? Who said something to you and stopped and started to form a word but nothing came out? What meaning did you return to? Who gave you returns thinking they were heard but were not? You cannot see the heard in the returns. You cannot see the soft in the returns. Who says you can know if someone really meant what they said, if they said it all before? Who was hiding in the heard returns? Who was lurking in the soft returns? Who is depending on you to know? Now instead it would be easy. Of course they might. Of course they might. Of course they won't. Of course it's great. Of course they meant it. Of course there was nothing. Of course there was something. Of course you didn't know. Of course she meant it. Of course she didn't mean it. Of course that's what he said. Of course Santa never was. Of course she believed in Santa. Of course the professor said we can't use the word vulnerable in any of our stories. Of course you didn't know. Of course she knew. Of course, right? Of course not. Of course, like I'm going there today. Of course you meant it. Of course you didn't. Of course you were wrong. Of course we knew. Uh, this is the last one. I saw nothing when I saw it. I didn't see nothing when I saw him. From $22 to $11 an hour, the factory downsizes. We have our secrets. Behavior is behavior. And I find myself having like thoughts. Visibly intoxicated roller skater. They're like, oh, I was freaking out for nothing. A small group of well-educated professionals enjoys rising wages while most workers toil in low-wage jobs with few chances to advance. Kenny Shopson, God bless. And when they look at my menu, the only conception they have is out, is out of their conception. Decoding metaphors. They what is the meaning. Good for them. Not. The text just means what it says it means. Excuse me, it says who? It's been there for God knows how long and now they're taking it. Don't ask me what I'm doing here. I don't know. When I saw it, I saw nothing. When I saw nothing, I couldn't believe it. When I couldn't believe it, I wondered if I could see it. If I could see it, I saw nothing when I saw it. When I saw it, I didn't want to believe it. Because I didn't want to believe it, I didn't flinch it. Because I didn't flinch it, everything seemed steady. Because everything seemed steady, nothing was breathing. Because nothing was breathing, it was all very still. Because it was all very still, nothing made waves. Because nothing made waves, there was no sound. Because there was no sound, there was no noise. Because there was no noise, no one could hear nothing. Because no one could hear nothing, no one was really listening. Because no one was really listening, no one really understood. Because no one really understood, nothing made sense. Because nothing made sense, we turned around at nothing at all. And when we turned around, we said nothing when we saw it. Thank you. Thank you, Steph. Our next reader will be Jen Eliana Hoffer. who's a poet, translator, social justice interpreter, teacher, facilitator, and urban cyclist. They live on unceded Tongva land in Los Angeles where they teach writing, work as sin, SINs Invalids Language Justice Coordinator and do language justice advocacy and organizing. 
Jan Elena publishes with numerous small independent presses and in various DIY slash DIT incarnations, excerpts from their most recent project, Unremembering, are at MAP Magazine, and they've received support from many uh, entities across the country. Please welcome Jan Elena, Eliana to the Brooklyn Rail. Hi. Can folks hear me okay? Great. So I'm going to share screen. And the first thing I want to show you is what happened when I just now turned around behind me to grab something I wanted to read. That's my cat pancake, who is 100% likely to leap across the screen as I read. Um, so, and that, that was my poem underneath pancakes, large body. Um, improving it shortly by editing, by napping, um, which goes with the chips in Julian's work. Um, so I'm going to read from three different projects that are all interconnected in some ways. Um, so I wanted to put a link in the chat to what I'm going to start reading from, which is um, what I'm working on right now, which is this project I'm provisionally calling Unremembering. Um, and then I'll read from a different piece of that project and then partway through, well, I'll put another link in the chat in a moment. So let me just see if I can get to my correct screen. And while I'm doing that, I would like to say how incredibly grateful I am to Steph um, for inviting me to be here. We connected first ever through poetry, and I really appreciate the reminder of the ways that poetry can open up relationships. So thank you for that, Steph. And thank you, everyone else I'm reading with. Um, I'm super, super honored and grateful to be in the presence of your work. Um, OK. Time, Sunday, August 1st, 2021. Much to lose, wide as day, a wave of humbling collapse. Once more as minute effort, vengeance withdrew to restore damaged allies. Minute effort failed, sands of shelter, hundreds of risk of billions, months of frustration, months hard, dysfunctional help, out of time, a possible wave, abrupt, day shifted course, tension of losing, prompt, a viable, untimely, ultimately unsuccessful rescue, results, action as a viable view. Oh, sorry, that was the poem I just read. And this is the poem I'm about to read. And you can click through them yourself if you want a more accurate view via the link. Time, Wednesday, August 4th, 2021. Touched last week, visit, cargo included facts, and the world's rough treasures, plywood culturally vital, holding cultural treasures. This is not just about a remarkable people, last year deteriorating more rapidly, a remarkable chapter in the story, so ravaged, its very history out of the ground and on display, a handful more severe definitive victory in effort, just people. So I'm going to read from a little DIY booklet, and I wanted to say that if you want a PDF version or an audio version of this booklet, you can put your email in the chat direct to me if you're not comfortable sharing it with everyone or sharing it with everyone, and I will send you one. Or you can, if you want an actual physical chat book in the mail, you can give me your street address via snail mail. Um, and so maybe I'll make it easy for you by putting my email in the chat if you want to do that. Um, I'm experimenting with how to continue being in the conversation of poetry while having taken a giant Oppen-esque pause in my actual public 
um, manifestations of poetry. So um, anyway, be in touch if you want to experience this work in a different way than you are right now. And I'm going to screen share again in one second. Um, and I'm going to do that from here, I think. Sorry, too much tech, but all will be well. Okay. Are you seeing a kind of pale lavender with blue risograph ink on it on your screen? Yeah, great. Thank you for the thumbs up, Carolyn. This is from a book called Memoria Indomesticada. I'm also belatedly to start my time. Memory unbegins where the water turned to dirt in a history that wasn't written. Sand is libation. Erosion is geography. Drought waterfalls. Lluvia descalza en la voz del río, voz de miel. Lluvia de abejas. Honeycomb river. Fossilized plastic no one can eat. Bone brittle, bone dry, bone bristled, where the wake of a person cracks open. Architectures of sunlight drawn by dust to disappear visibly. Unsettled curvatures electricity refuses to trace. Mist placeless transit toward channelized pressures aching to overspill the surface area. We have lost our memory and the implication is there was something meant to be saved, says my student who is my teacher. I am turning, spinning, or time is. Past events and what did not happen spooling out before us, threading. Ferns, dunes, do's, undoing. What is needed is listening across, toward, see to it, look to it, may it be so. It does not have to be done by me. I have to keep doing it, to be part of it. At four years old, Z says, I'm not a ghost, I'm a person. What makes me a person is that I am made of parts. The sound a body makes eroding against the world eroding overtakes the thread of a voice hilando tenue en su canal tapada. Construimos la casa que nunca habitamos, el mapa del cuerpo de la casa que nunca trazamos, el registro que nunca documentamos. Información desintegrada, información de síntesis sagrada. Conditioning. I'm biking through the world Will Alexander calls a combustible complex, or I'm biking through the shifting molecular interruptive design colonially and colloquially called Los Angeles, or I'm sitting on a concrete slab organized to prevent public rest next to a person whose shoes are held together with toothbrushes, or I'm sitting in an elongated rectangle where cobwebs intercept the air into particles swelling. Is there a finite number of words? Dear Dada, sometimes we mistake cataloging for attention. I want to offer the person some of my lunch, but I'm not sure what kinds of eating are possible with with only a couple of teeth, and it pains me to ask, what can we actually unlearn? I don't know why anyone needs poetry, and I know not everyone needs it, but I also know some people need poetry some or all of the time. 
The shift Will calls the electricity of language or Seshu Foster's invitation, I am looking at your mouth to see what you will say. The cat who came in off the street, who was on my screen a moment to go some 13 years ago, maybe more, has malignant melanoma. The same cat who drew my nine-year-old favorite neighbor, Esperanza, to my house. She spells it N-A-B-E-R. Sarita Morgan wrote, I feel myself craving a fallow place. The distance between the tree and the roof is none in two places in the garden, one encroaching eucalyptus and one homonymic elm tree on Elm Street. Between the time I wrote the conditions poem that attended to the numbers of children separated from their parents at the US-Mexico border and the time of this writing, two days passed and the number nearly doubled. Just for example, what is the distance between fallow and falling, between between and in, between outside and out of time, between fertile and forcible and futile. The cat's name is Pancake. The cancer at the moment is dormant. There are eight eucalyptus, though in one spot, three trunks share a common root system. I might have the numbers wrong. Pancake is a popular cat. Lisa Ann Auerbach once made him his own Facebook fan page, and he used to receive regular visits from four-year-old Phoebe down the block who knew where my house key was hidden, or her dad did. When Will performs Water on New Mars with Gassim Batamuntu and the new Nova compound, the moment where the higher, sharper voice enters, scream singing into the oceanic soundscape soil, is the moment that reminds me of Seshu's invocations of those who walked among us, cities of forgetting. Heart stopping every time, but then starting again with more heart, or as Sarita puts it, I want to feel possible in all of the intimacies, radical, queer, sisterhood, state, room. In other words, the heart, its own many-roomed country. In actuality, there are two encroaching elm trees, both leaning on structures intended only to bear their own weight. Quote, the more things remain the same, the more things remain the same, was the reaction to contemporary right now police murders of unarmed African American people from Albert Woodfox, rest in power last week, who spent more than 15,695 days caged in solitary confinement for murdering a prison guard, a crime he did not commit. Dear Data, I try to remember that to be accountable is not to be singularly accountable. The trees are called Chinese elms, though they are native to China, India, Taiwan, Japan, North Korea, and Vietnam. In Seshu's book, City of the Future, the oft unnoticed word V is a key player, almost an activist. In Los Angeles, mockingbirds accompany late nights in early summer. They can imitate cell phones, car alarms, and police sirens. What can we actually learn? When I wrote the first poems titled Conditions and Conditioning, I was nobody's mother. The Chinese elm is also called lace bark elm for the weft of its skin, which occasionally sloughs in a pattern that could be mistaken for continents. But there is no map, or if there is, it is only in imagination. So I'm gonna share with you briefly. Um, let's see, a link to, so that poem mentions a project called Conditions, which I was blessed to co-create initially with TC Tolbert. I just put a link to it in the chat if you're interested. Um, I took some of the seeds of what TC and I co-created and I, I'm running with it and making with um, his blessing, making um, a book of conditions and conditioning. And I'm going to end by reading um, a couple more works from Unremembering, except that that didn't change the screen, did it? Did your screen change or do you still see leaves? Still leaves. Okay, I'm gonna stop screen share for one second and start it again. Sorry about that. Let's see if we can make 
Zoom do my bidding. How about, oh, that's not what I want to show you though. I want to show you this. Hold on a second. Maybe Zoom is going to get the better of me today, but I don't think so. Okay. Stop share. Come back to me. There we go. How about that? Better or not better? Let's see. View, full screen. That is what I want you to see for now. Time. Friday, August 13th, 2021. Lapse within the next month and sharply deteriorating as rapidly advance across ever shrinking territory. My life through tears, a metal bench as the scorching sun battling at a brisk pace, a minute two month tension, people in their homes, a shell-shocked upended life lasted all of 15 minutes. Not, no, it is really scary. Record. Rather, repeating, resolve, released, rated, responding, relying, raised, retiring, regaining, remaining, ready, reddish, recovering, rarely, restaurant, repurposed, relay, relatives, reaction, ribs, retrograde, wrath, return, report, 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 repeat. Reside, river, recurring, resident, round, resident, respond, respond, recent, rolls, rose, resented, reportedly, rose, reports, residents, resources, restaurants, rose, re-inspect, rate, rose, refer, rose, rose, riot, room, rural, run, rose, 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 results, ring, refusing, ray, return, record. Thank you. Thank you, Jen. And our uh, final reader today will be Brenda Ijima, based in Brooklyn. Brenda is a poet, playwright, choreographer, and visual artist. She's the author of nine books of poetry and the founding editor slash publisher of Portable Press at Yo-Yo Labs. Her involvements occur at the intersections and mutations of genre, mode, receptivity, and field of study. Her current work engages submerged and occluded histories other than human modes of expression and telluric awareness in all forms. Please welcome Brenda Ajima to the series. Hello, everyone. I'm just going to read one brief fragment from a novel I'm just finishing up called Presence. Um, but before doing so, I want to introduce you to this beautiful collage um, by Troy Nishi. Um, I hope it will be the cover of the book. I don't know if I'm holding it to the camera well enough. Philomela. So just imagine you found this little fragment under a huge garbage dump, and it's very old. Philomela, songs of solidarity and songs of lament were sung by children and adults alike. Enduring a lifespan was a challenge. The stresses of interesting strife, unbridled political tension, and other pressures social in nature whose effects were banal, commonplace, occurred uninterruptedly. A song about a spider was a song of survival. Down came the rain and washed the spider out. Out came the sun and dried up all the rain and the itsy bitsy spider climbed up the spout again. In another version of the song, most likely the original version, a more sinister tone is struck. The song goes, oh, the blooming bloody spider went up the spider web. The blooming bloody rain came down and washed the spider out. The blooming bloody sun came out and dried up all the rain, and the blooming bloody spider came up the web again. 
In one minor episode in Greek mythology, there was a boy named Phidias. His name reminds us of the spider in the song. We know how his life how life ended for Idias, a conclusive blunt edge. His story echoes that of the blooming bloody spider. We know that the Phrygians entered Anatolia from Europe by means of the strait. And according to the historian Herodotus, when they were in Europe, they were called the Briggs of Beards. The Phrygians died out or lost out to the Medes, and the Medes succumbed to the Persians, who called the region beautiful horse country. Many invaders had raided and laid claim to the land Alexander the Great, the Ottomans, the Persians, the Hittites, and the Romans. The fairy chimneys and other rock formations were used as safe houses. The rock churches were accessible through tunnels, and the underground cities were where scriptatoriums existed, a place where printed matter in incunabula was stored. Within a trove of document, within the trove of documentation, we found stories of Greek mythology. The stories were convoluted as all that exists are fragmentary scraps. Recovered maps too are mostly damaged and we collage them into new configurations. Philomela was a princess of Athens. She wished to visit her sister, Procene, who lived with her husband in Scrap, a distance away. Carius, Procene's husband, agreed to escort Philomela to their home in Scrap to reunite, reunite the sister. En route, Carius raped Philomena, then raped her a second time when, he thre when she threatened to denounce him, so he cut out her tongue. Additionally cautious and cruel, he imprisoned her in a cabin in a wooded area, somewhere forlorn and remote, to prevent her from escaping. There, Philomela stitched a scroll that depicted the crime and somehow managed to send the tapestry to her sister, who eventually rescued her. Procene, enraged by her husband, killed her son Idias and dismembered his body. She cooked the child's remains and served them to her husband. Philomela encouraged her sister to do so. Philomela and Procene's sorrow and rage are a relation of feeling that collapsed in on itself, pulverizing the form, smashed out the glass windows and blasted the oak of the door. The sisters fed the body of the young boy to the rapist. Why this made sense to them is a synonymous madness the transference of violence from Philomela onto the son of the victimizer. We have no more information how the consequences unfolded in this icon iconoclastic period of inconspicuous trauma and erosion. Philomela, with her somber eyes, perfectly frontal, superimposed on life in the thickness of space, could seem to disappear. From within the layers of her robe, she held out a vessel filled with wine, the color of blood, made from grapes, as she gave an account to the ministers and figures waiting by her. In this depiction, her sister is not standing near her. They entered a labyrinth of trauma with many levels and where water seeped through and the wind collided. We admire their struggles. By the time the sisters approached the deer watering at the stream, they had transformed. Philomela became a nightingale and Procene a sparrow. As a nightingale, still Philomela could not vocalize. Carius too had been transformed into a hawk, collective memory pooled by the rocks. A cruel paradox began to take shape in the form of the psychic aftermath that trickled along history's path. Luckily, they could fly. Thank you so much. That's all I'm going to read because it's late in the day. Thank you, Brenda. That was great. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. And thanks, everybody, for reading. Thank you, Steph, Julian, Jen, Brenda C, Brenda I. Um, next week, the reading is going to be uh, put together by Chris Tisch. Uh, out in Detroit, and the following week, Sahar Muradi will be the 
organizer and the week after that Veep Bakaitis and I'll round out uh, August so please come back and join us as you can and um, I think now is the part where everybody gets to say hello at the same time and then uh, move on into the day thanks everybody thank, thank you, you so thank much you. Thank you. Great thanks everyone. very much it's so great to be here that was incredible thank Amazing. you <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, Steph. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I'll send the recording soon. So. <laughs> Have a good day. Thanks, everyone. Bye.